Hi, my name is Kurt Benke. I work with Septima in Copenhagen, Denmark. And in this video, I'm going to cover new features released as part of QGIS 330, Certigen Bosch. And this version was just released a little over a week ago on March 4th. So it's still very new. And there are quite a long list of new features associated with Certigen Bosch. So as a reminder, when you're in QGIS, you can always go to the help menu to about and find out what version of QGIS you're running, what packages are compiled against it. And if you go to the What's New tab, you can find a list of all the versions of QGIS, and you can click on one, such as 3.30, and see a list of the new features, or for some cases, a, a link to the visual change log. So you can see there's quite a long list of new features here in 3.30. So they fall into 20 different categories, and there are over 50 new features. And I'm certainly not going to go through all of them. Some of them are very specific or you know, minor features for most users. Um, I'm going to go through the ones highlighted in yellow, which seem to be the what I, what I feel are probably the most important for the vast majority of QGIS users. And I also have the link down below for the visual change log for 3.30, um, which is a much more thorough coverage of what's included with all these new features. So you may want to also um, visit that link. So I'm going to start with this first breaking change. QGIS has dropped project backward compatibility for Symbology with QGIS 316 and older. So with previous releases of QGIS, they would write significant amounts of compatibility objects into the XML structure of project files to maintain backward compatibility for Symbology. And this has been removed. So this simply means if you have older QGIS project files laying around, you should probably open them up in a version of QGIS 316 or newer um, to update that symbology to uh, a later version of QGIS before you try to open them in 330, just so that you can try to maintain any symbology from an older project. There were several expressions introduced at 3.30. I'll be showing a use case for map to HTML table. And also that will include the raster attributes function, which is new and is associated with some exciting new functions with uh, 3.30. There's uh, feature ID, which returns the feature ID. And there's also two kind of related features. Is feature valid and is attribute valid that you can use to test validity of features or attributes, if you had constraints against those. And then the series of X at, Y at, Z at, M at, replace the old dollar X at series of um, variables and functions. So these are what's new in expressions. Moving on to map tools, there's a nice new feature for um, identify features where you can uh, set it to work on mouse movements with no clicking. And then another map tool is raster map tips. So starting with the identify and mouse over, if I click the identify features tool and I'm looking at this elevation data set, I can now set identify results to identify features on mouse over. And now as I hover over the map, I get a live update of the elevation at my cursor position as I move over this elevation surface. So that's a nice new feature. It's also now possible to have raster map tips. So here I have a categorical raster. And on the Layer Properties Display tab, I can insert an expression using map to HTML table and using raster attribute uh, function and the layer cursor point function to create an action for map tips. And I can now get this map tip popping up. And to be honest, I didn't spend a lot of time configuring this map tip so I'm not getting the whole attribute table to pop up, but you can see how that would work. Okay, so that's a segue into the raster related features, native support for raster attribute tables. So a year ago, there was a plugin written to support raster attribute tables. Now at 3.30, that functionality found in that plugin for raster attribute tables is now written into QGIS core and includes a series of related functions. We're going to cover automatic styling of rasters, changing classifications, using the identify tool, 
looking at properties of raster attribute tables, editing raster attribute tables, and creating a new raster attribute table from a current classification. So starting with automatic raster styling, if I have a categorical raster data set with an associated raster attribute table and I drag and drop it onto the QGIS map canvas, it'll come in automatically styled according to the classification. And you can see if I right click, I have an open raster attribute table action on the context menu and I'm seeing the raster attribute table with those colors for the classification stored in that color column. We can also change the classification. So I can open up the raster attribute table from the layer context menu. I can then choose a different attribute column to base the classification on. So here I'm choosing this NVSC class column and I click classify and it's going to overwrite the current classification with a classification based on these new data values. And I end up with a newly classified raster attribute table. Here, the raster attribute table support includes the identify tool. So as I click on the raster, I get the attribute columns and the associated values with identify results, just as I would with a vector data set. And if I open up layer properties for this raster, you'll notice that there's an attribute tables tab now for raster data sets. And so here I can preview the entire rat and I can even do some editing. So for example, um, across the top here, I can put the table into edit mode and click on this one particular color and use the color widget to change the color to another value, put the table out of editing mode, click OK to close. I can do more editing to the raster attribute table. So once it's in edit mode, I can also add a new column or a new row. So here I'm adding a new column. I'm going to make it a, a name column and I'm going to name it yes, no. So I'll just use this to classify the raster, um, perhaps positive or negative for a particular habitat type. So I can see the new yes, no column has now been added and I can populate that with values as I've just done. And I can now use that new column to classify this raster. So I'm gonna save my changes. And I'm gonna choose this new yes, no column and classify the raster based on that. So now I've kind of got a Boolean classification um, based on my reclassification of these values. I can also create a rat from a current classification. So here I'm dragging in a copy of this raster data set that doesn't have an associated table. I'm going to use the palleted unique values renderer against it and then classify it. And if I open up layer properties for this, I now have the option on the attributes tab to create a new attribute table from the current symbology. So I can choose a couple options here. I'm going to choose a sidecar vat and click OK and I now have that new raster attribute table created from the classification. So a very exciting series of functions now for raster data. Moving on to the layer legend, there's new layer ordering settings available. So if you go to settings, canvas and legend, there's a new entry for behavior used when adding new layers. And typically it's always been above the currently selected layer. You now have the option to choose always on top of the layer tree or optimal index within the layer tree group. And so in this next example, I'm going to choose this last option, optimal index within a layer tree group. And this affects how a series of layers dragged and dropped from Windows Explorer, for example, onto the QGIS map canvas will behave when added to a project. So here I have an empty project and I'm dragging a group of seven layers on there. And using the default behavior in 328, I see that they're alphabetical. With this new option in 330, I add the same layers. They get ordered more intelligently with points over lines over polygons. And so if I compare the two side by side, you can see how the two different versions and two settings change how those layers are added to the map canvas. Moving on to print layouts, there's two uh, significant changes. There's a shortcut manager now in the print composer and there are elevation profile plots that are supported by print compositions. So here I have a blank map 
canvas. And I'm going to go to settings, keyboard shortcuts, which is new. And I can select map, click change, and enter control M for the shortcut for adding a map object. And now I can hit control M on my keyboard and simply drag a rectangle where I'd like the map to go. And the map is added. I'm going to go back to the keyboard shortcuts and select add label. And I'll enter control T for that. Hit close. Hit control T on my keyboard. And now I have my label for my map title entered onto the map. So if you're a fan of keyboard shortcuts, this is a nice addition. Being able to set those for different actions in a print composition. The other new major change in print compositions at 3.30 is support of elevation profile plots. So these were introduced at 3.26, I believe, and they're now supported in a print composition. So there's a new add elevation profile plot button here in uh, the print composition, and I can use that to um, drag a plot frame onto the map composition and use the settings within item properties to configure that. Here I've used this button to import the profile as I had set it up in the main QGIS map canvas, and now it's on my print composition. And you have uh, several different um, ways you can configure that plot once it's on the print composition. Moving on to field forms and widgets. For quite a while now, you've been able to add photographs uh, to an attribute form as attachments. You can now add audiovisual multimedia files to attribute forms as attachments. There's also data defined editable states for form widgets, meaning you can use a data defined override to control if a element in a form is editable or not. Text and HTML widgets now support dynamic text via the current value function. So this means that data entered into the form can be used in expressions to create dynamic text in HTML within the field form. And there are also now spacer widgets to help control how the field form appears. So starting with audio visual multimedia support, if I open up layer properties for a layer here, I have my attributes form open. I have an area field. I have a photo field, which is the widget type of attachment with an image. But I can now have a field called audio recording. And in the integrated document viewer, I can set that to audio. And I can also do that with video. So I think for field data collection project files, this is going to be super handy to be able to collect not only photos, but audio and video. If I put this field form view, I can see that I have a photograph, but I also have a video recording attached in my form, and I also have an audio recording. So again, this will be fantastic for field data collection. There's also now data to find editable states for form widgets. So here I have this name field, and I have a series of other fields. And so here there's a data to find override next to editable, and I can create an expression where the field name is not null or doesn't have or doesn't have an empty value. So this means that as soon as I start putting this layer into um, edit mode and adding new values, I can control which fields are editable based on values entered into the form. So for example, I'll put this into edit mode and add a new point, and my field form will come up. And as soon as I start typing a value into the name field, now the other fields become active. So I can control the editability. Another um, related feature are dynamic text and spacer widgets. So here um, I have this empty space here. It's a, using a spacer widget. If I double click on that, I can bring up the properties for that spacer widget, and there's an option to draw a horizontal line. If I double click on this density, this is a text widget, and I've inserted an expression using the current value so that this will um, compute the density. I have two 
fields population and area. And so I can rename this as density persons per square kilometer. And it's going to use this expression to populate the value. So again, if I put this layer into edit mode and add a point, my form comes up. I can enter a population, 10,000, and enter an area, uh, 280. And the density down below gets automatically calculated because it's dynamic text based on that current value. So a lot of new features here that I think are especially useful for folks involved in data collection. Lastly, there it's now possible from the data source manager to add XYZ tile layers without having to create a connection first. So here I'm actually showing um, creating a new connection, but you'll see that once this um, once this is configured, I can connect to this without actually having to save the connection. So this is just a, a, a nice new way if you need to quickly add an XYZ tile layer but don't want to have a formal connection to it, you can do that as well. Thanks for watching. Here's my contact information and a link to our courses.